I wonder, what is the best Christmas present you never got? I do realise that that question makes me sound rather spoiled, doesn't it? But anyway, I will never forget one Christmas, I was probably about 10, when all I wanted was roller skates. To this day, I can't really remember why, probably because that's what everyone else had at the time, but I had my heart totally set on getting a pair of inline black blades and uh, that was gonna make my Christmas. I made sure it was the only big present on my Christmas list that year. In fact, my general strategy uh, for Christmas is to only give the exact number of ideas for the number of people that I expected to buy me a present so I could guarantee that I would get what I wanted. Uh, I don't know about you, maybe you can relate to that. Maybe it's just me. Do you want to know what happened? Well, I didn't get them. I opened all my presents and I couldn't believe that my parents, obviously acting as proxy for Santa, didn't get me the roller skates. To this day, I can't for the life of me remember what I did get, but I do know what I didn't get. And I certainly was not very happy with my parents. So yes, I am totally spoiled. Now you might be wondering, why am I telling you this ridiculous story? One of the major themes in the Bible is that of hope. Typically, a person uses the word hope in the following way. I hope I meet someone one day. I hope I get a better job. I hope that you feel better. I hope I get roller skates for Christmas. The Cambridge Dictionary defines hope in the following way. To want something to happen or to be true and to usually underline usually, have a good reason to think that it might. The story I just shared is a silly one, I know, but the reality is that if you're anything like me, you can approach your relationship with God and your life following Jesus in a similar way. We have certain hopes and expectations about how things are going to go in our lives, how our lives are going to play out. It's been famously said that in the spiritual life, nothing, underline nothing goes the way we expect. In fact, in my experience, you only realise what your hopes and expectations were the moment you realise that they aren't going to be met. And in those moments, it is very easy to conclude that God maybe isn't as good as you thought and you can lose hope. To lose hope means to stop believing that something you might want to happen might still be possible. Or as I would put it, to lose hope is to give up believing that the future holds something good because of a number of things that have turned out to be really bad. I wonder if you can relate to that. The problem is that a hope in things going a particular way is in fact a false hope. And if your hope is based on things in your life going a particular way, you're almost guaranteed to be disappointed. That kind of hope will let you down. And the temptation at that point when that hope fails you is to give up and walk away from God. So if that's you today, I have some really, really good news. As followers of Jesus, hope is something that is altogether quite different. The Bible talks about hope that will never let you down. And more than that, the Christian hope is one that cannot let you down. So we're in this uh, summer of blessing looking at Psalm 23 and in this psalm King David summarises a series of incredible statements about God's loving unfailing commitment to those that love and trust him. We've been reading it together every week so let's do that together now. The Lord is our shepherd, we lack nothing. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside quiet waters. He refreshes our souls. He guides us along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though we walk through the darkest valley, we will fear no evil, for you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemies. You anoint our heads with oil. Our cups overflow. Surely your goodness and love will follow us all the days of our lives 
and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So, throughout May and June, we've been exploring this psalm, and we've discovered some incredible promises about what, will, what God will do for those who trust him. He will provide for our every need. We never need to be anxious ever again. He brings rest, refreshing a new life when you feel tired, worn out, and you feel like you're done. He speaks to us. And yet, we can trust him to lead us and guide us in the, in the best way, even if we're not confident that we can hear him. He brings us back to the right path again and again and again because our natural tendency is to wander off and end up in trouble whether we realise it or not. During the dark and scary and lowly times when we feel so tempted to believe that God has forgotten or abandoned us, in fact the opposite is true. He is with us. In the middle of the battles of life, he makes it possible for us to experience peace, to stop fighting, to experience his generous, overflowing blessing, favour and friendship. All of this unpacks what it means when David says, the Lord is my shepherd. So before I go any further, I want to ask you a question. Have you made the Lord your shepherd? If not, what's stopping you? What's stopping you from trusting him rather than yourself or something or someone else? What's stopping you from asking him to be your Lord and shepherd? and committing yourself to following him, trusting him with your life. How is it possible to do that? Because he has already laid down his life for you. When Jesus died on the cross, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He has made it possible for us to be forgiven for all the times that we've ignored him and wandered away and receive the gift of his Holy Spirit, his love and power at work in us, helping us become everything he had made us to be and do everything that he's called us to do. The Lord is my shepherd. Is he yours? Up until this point that we've been looking at this psalm, all the statements have been phrased in the present tense. It's he does this, he does that. Now, in this final verse, the tense changes from present to the future. And it's like David is looking up from his current circumstances to the horizon. He sees, he's seeing what is coming. And this is what he sees. Surely, he says. Everyone say, surely. I'm going to pause here. He doesn't say maybe. He doesn't say hopefully. He doesn't say if I pray enough, I'll do all the right things. He doesn't say if I'm a good person or a good Christian. He just says Surely, whatever he is about to say next, he is very confident is going to happen. It's guaranteed. Something is on the way. When you order something from Amazon and you get an email saying that it's out for delivery, it's an exciting little moment, isn't it? You don't think, oh, I hope it's going to turn up one day. And by that, what you would really mean is it may or may not come, but you hope that it will. No. When you get an email from Amazon saying that the parcel is out for delivery, you know it is on the way. It's just a matter of time, but you know it's coming. You might not wait for it that patiently. You might want it right now, but you know it's coming. It's on the way. This, in fact, is what the Christian gift of hope is. It is the anticipation that something that God has promised is coming. Every promise from God written in your Bible is an email telling you that it's out for delivery. It's coming. It's just a matter of time. You might not wait for it patiently. You might want it right now, but you know it's on the way. It's coming. So that's the first word. Surely. Surely what? Well, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So I want to split this into two parts. The first, hope for this life. And the second is hope for the life to come. This week, I'm going to focus on the first part of this verse. I want to talk about the hope that we have for this life. If a false hope is the hope 
that things will go a particular way in our lives, then what is true hope? What is it that we can expect to happen? And like David say, surely, what is it that is already out for delivery? And it's this, that God's goodness and love will follow you all the days of your life. So let's break this down. The word goodness, it means everything that comes from God that is pleasing and satisfying and life-giving. In other words, it's the things that God says and does to you and for you that make you say, wow, God, you are so good. The word that has been translated love or unfailing love or mercy or kindness is a translation of a Hebrew word chesed. Right? Everyone say chesed. The word chesed is a Hebrew word that literally means covenant faithfulness. It encapsulates this idea that God is reliable and will keep every single promise that he has made. A covenant is an agreement between two parties to fulfill certain promises which are not based on either party's ability to keep those promises. In a covenant, two people say, or two parties say, I will do these things, and if I stop doing these things, these are the consequences. It's very different to a contract that says, I will do these things as long as you do those things. For example, if you are Disney, you say to your customers, as long as you keep paying your monthly fee, I will keep providing you with access to an endless and ever-expanding quantity of Star Wars, which I thoroughly enjoy. But this is, this is really important because the way that the Bible talks about a relationship with God is covenant, not contract. It is a relationship based on God's promise, not our performance. The night before Jesus was betrayed and sent to his death on the cross, he was having a meal with his disciples and he passed them a cup of wine and he said this to them, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. The old covenant was based on the spiritual performance of the people of God and their ability to continually do all the things expected of them. And it didn't work out. The new covenant is God's gracious gift to us in Christ, sealed by his blood that was shed on the cross and is received by faith, or in other words, by simply accepting that it's true. The new covenant is God's promise to us that in Christ, this is the definitive, decisive, conclusive, irrefutable, indisputable evidence that God will do good to us because he has already done the greatest good for us in forgiving us of our sins, reconciling us to himself through his son and the giving of the gift of his spirit, which is the guarantee that we'll not only have God in this life, but in the eternity to come. This is the hope of a person who trusts in Jesus Christ. It is not that everything will go the way we expect, but it is that we can expect that in this life, in all the seasons, in the good seasons and the bad seasons, God will do good to us. He will be faithful to every promise he has made. The word translated follows in this sentence, surely his goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, is really better translated as to pursue or chase down. It's like David saying, whatever happens, whatever I do, I can't escape from God's promise and commitment to do good to me. It will only chase me down and catch me in the end. Now David, the person that wrote this psalm, he did not have an easy life. As a teenager and into his 20s, he left his family to serve a king who became jealous of him and tried to kill him multiple times. His best friend was killed in battle. He had an affair and the woman became pregnant and to try and cover it up, he had the woman's husband killed and in the end, the child tragically died. You could easily say, David, look at your circumstances. God is not doing good to you. Or David, look at what you have done. God is not going to do good to you now. You don't deserve it. But that is a contract, not a covenant. God is the God of covenants. 
As David looked back over his life, he could see all the signs of God's unfailing love and goodness following him through all of his own ups and downs, through the times that he did well and the times he did really badly. And he was therefore able to look forward to the future and with confidence and say, surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, I think that this psalm just doesn't romanticise or idealise life. It's totally realistic. There will be times when we panic because we worry that we don't have even the basics and the essentials. There are times when we'll feel burned out, tired and disillusioned. There are times when we wander off. There are times of isolation, uncertainty, loneliness and fear. We will all go through these times. For us, there will be times when things don't go the way we had expected. A close friend moves away to another city. A relationship breaks down because someone that you love hurts you or you've hurt them. A job is lost or a business or a career or a ministry doesn't develop in the way that you had dreamed and hoped. Or a child is born with a need that has a major impact on your family life and dreams for the future. There will be times when a little voice tells us, if God really loved you, would you be going through this? And there will be times when we make mistakes, maybe really big mistakes, and that you get that little voice say to you, how can God do good to you now? You don't deserve it, it's over. Each of us in those moments have a decision to make. Will we listen to those voices or will we listen to the truth of God's word and stand upon it, saying, surely his goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Personally, I find these verses a huge challenge. When I first became a follower of Jesus and experienced of love, I, I, I must have thought, that's it, everything is going to turn out great. It's right up and to the left from here. How wrong I was. I've had moments of being thoroughly disillusioned with myself, thoroughly disillusioned with friends, the church, and even with God, because things just haven't turned out how I expected. Looking back now, I know that I've experienced periods of depression following those experiences, times of feeling very low. The temptation during these seasons is to lose hope and give up. But I actually, I wonder if through it all, God has actually been doing a great work in me to lead me beyond the shallow hope in things going how I want and expect to a deeper and truer hope that whatever happens, God will do good to me because it is who he is and he has promised he will. And if God is for me, then who or what can be against me? Let me give an example. My dad was first diagnosed with cancer eight years ago this summer. Actually, I think it was nine years. It was an awful shock at the time. There's no history of it in the family, and well, you just never think it's going to happen to you. Over the years, he's been treated in various ways, but it's just never fully gone away, even to this day. People might say, but he believes in God. How can God allow that to happen to him? There was a time when I really used to struggle with that too. But as we look back now, we see God's goodness and mercy, his love, and that's the thing, isn't it? You can only normally see it in hindsight. We recently found out, for example, that there was a two-year uh, clinical trial that he was recommended for but wasn't successful in joining. It has recently concluded uh, that trial and the evidence showed that this particular drug demonstrated no benefit to the patient. If Dad had been on that trial, he would have had to go into the Christie twice a week for two years only to find out that in the end it wouldn't have made a difference anyway. At the time, two years ago, you know, we were really upset that Dad hadn't been able to join it, but now we look back and thank God that he didn't. Last year, Rebecca and I started a group for our friends and uh, our neighbours who we've got to know and uh, that are interested in exploring faith. We've recently started going through Mark's Gospel and encouraging them to read a chapter on their own during the week. A couple of weeks ago, we asked everyone how they'd been getting on. One lady said, Mark chapter one, that's when Peter's mother-in-law is healed of a fever, right? And we were like, yeah. And the man that was healed of leprosy, and we were like, yeah. 
kind of wondering where she's going with all of this. She said, can I ask you a question? Yes. You believe Jesus can heal, but your dad still has cancer. Why are you not angry at God? What a question. First and, firstly, I realised, oh yeah, I'm not actually angry with God. A few years ago, I would have been, and I have been, about many things. And secondly, it opened up this amazing conversation about the faithfulness and goodness of God. And at the end, she told us that she'd been talking about my dad with one of her colleagues at work, and she was trying to get her head around uh, our response to these situations. And she told us that she asked him why he thought I wasn't angry, and he said it this to her, it's because he has hope. The final part of this verse says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that's the hope for the life to come. This is the ultimate hope. In the end, it's not a hope for this life, but for the life to come. That for those who have put their trust in Jesus, you can face anything that comes with confidence and without fear, even death itself, because we know that whatever happens in this very, very short life, because Jesus Christ died and rose again, that those who love and trust him, even though we will all die, will be raised with him and get to spend eternity with him. Surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.